Hey, welcome to the latest uh, PSA and BISA joint webinar on Teaching Politics Online. My name is Donna Smith from the Open University and I'm co-chair of the PSA Teaching and Learning Network. As you will all be very aware, uh, most universities have had to move their teaching offer online due to the current coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, but now the kind of immediate crisis response phase has passed. We've been doing these seminars to reflect on best practice in teaching online as it's very likely that many of us will do more online teaching um, in the future, either in response to the pandemic or just because our teaching and learning models have changed in response to it um, more generally. So this particular webinar series focuses on module design and production, looking ahead to autumn teaching, building on the, uh, the, the seminar series we've run previously, um, be PSA and BISA too. So today's session is called What Makes a Good Online Lecture by Maxine David. Um, the session will cover how to best deliver online lectures, the relative merits of uh, lectures delivered asynchronously versus synchronously, different platforms, lecture techniques, um, how to anticipate problems, and how to share lectures to create connected classrooms. So we're due to finish in about an hour's time. There'll be time for questions. Um, please do post your questions in the chat as we go along and we'll uh, look at them at the end. Um, Jamie from the PSA is here as well in case we have any technical issues. Um, do note this session's recorded and make sure you're muted for now. So without further ado, please welcome Maxine. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to both BISA and PSA for inviting me to do this. Um, thank you, Donna, as the initial contact, um, and Jamie, who's uh, already helping us out with the technical issues that we're experiencing, which is getting me right back into teaching mode. Um, and thank you also to all of you in attendance, especially when so many of us are melting in this heat. And no doubt, because we would like to be where our students imagine us to be, i.e. relaxing somewhere beautiful with a cocktail in our hands. I'm sure you've had those emails already. So um, let's proceed to business and think a little bit about what makes a good online lecture. Um, because of the technical issues um, with Zoom, I'm, I'm afraid this is the best that we can do. So forgive having the slides on the side, but uh, I'm sure we'll all cope. So here's a brief outline of what I would like to cover. Um, it will take um, like 25 to 30 minutes and then allow us to have uh, the same amount of time or a little bit more for any questions or comments that you may have. And I definitely would like to hear from colleagues because ultimately I'm fairly new to this online world myself. As I said in the blurb for this talk, one of the benefits of where we are now is that none of us is actually questioning whether or not a lecture is a good thing, all right? So we're not questioning the virtues of a lecture per se, rather we're just focused on um, how best to deliver it when online. I do think, however, that it is worth reflecting on some of those doubts expressed about the utility of a lecture because they stem from questions that are still relevant to us now. So for instance, about student attendance, this isn't going to go away necessarily just because we are online. Um, if we think also about the utility of a lecture versus any other activity that we might do, given that our goal really is to achieve deep learning. We also talk a lot in the literature about lectures in terms of, of our own individual capacities to lecture well, about students' capacities to concentrate for longer than 20 minutes, which incidentally, um, for those of you who don't know already, and I'm sure that we all do now, um, 20 minutes is the magic number that's cited in most literature about student attention spans. Now, all of these things remain relevant online, even attendance, because reasons for non-attendance at a synchronous lecture may still pertain. I just want to focus a little also on the purpose of a lecture in respect of learning. I don't think that anybody disputes anymore the role of knowledge acquisition in learning, but I am certainly one of those who says, who says to her students, I am not here to be um, some kind of transmission belt, some conveyor belt for knowledge. But essentially that is part of my role and it is certainly part of the role of a lecture. So one part of the role of the lecture is to transmit knowledge, although I would put it another way and say, it is about being an aid to students in their reading to help them make sense of all the information that they have in their reading and to know what it is that they absolutely do need to spend 
time learning, right? So what in that reading that Maxine gave me should I really be concentrating on? So the types of things we typically focus on in lectures are key concepts, um, ways of seeing, so theories, identifying evidence, what looks like good evidence, and also making a connection. So this I think is a big part, helping students understand how we apply abstract knowledge. But for that deeper learning, to give students the space to apply and to practice, we still need those tutorials or seminars. When preparing your lectures then, um, be sure that you see them and you treat them as a series of lectures that fit within a course and within, within a course that fits within a program of study. Now, arguably, this is one of the things that we're not so good at in the face-to-face -face world, but it's doubly important in a situation where the opportunities for social learning are se severely constrained, i.e. in the online world. So we really need to work hard to identify and crucially to articulate those connections for students in our online lectures. And I want to come back to this a bit when I'm talking later about student engagement. Um, but I taught a week-long summer school earlier in the summer and what became very, very quickly clear to me was that students needed me to help them see how what we did on Monday fitted with what we were going to do on Friday because they were looking ahead. But also, once we got to Friday, I had to refer them back to what we did on Tuesday, say, to help them see the connections, the differences, the similarities. Um, I was always reminding them, therefore, of what was to come and what had come. And it was really important as well in terms of building their confidence to focus on what we had done so that they could see, okay, actually, this isn't new to me. I understand how to do it. The only thing that is new here is a different situation, but I can still apply that knowledge. So that kind of connection making um, is going to be even more the case in an online lecture series that's strung out over a number of weeks. So um, one of my tips would really be to ensure that you are delivering prompts to your students at regular intervals, but also testing as well. So asking, making um, room to ask questions about what they are learning in the lectures. In terms of building the lectures as well, remember to build the lectures with your course and your program learning objectives and outcomes in mind. Um, now, I'm not sure I've been reading so much and I've actually attended quite a lot of these webinars as well already, so I'm not quite sure where this came from. But um, a few people have been talking about the fact that learning objectives and learning outcomes are often treated as being the same thing, but actually they are different things. There is a relationship, of course. Um, but you might say that in a sense, one is a hope and then the other is very, very much an expectation. And finally here, the point about your student situations, you do need to know your students. I, for instance, never invite a guest speaker without giving them at least a little bit of information about the student body, about their program or programs of study, their level of study, their theoretical or methodological preparedness. And you need to go even further and remember now that um, there is a reason for us going online, that it is a pandemic, and that this is compromising some students far more than others. So ask yourself, is your lecture good enough for the students sitting in their own room with good bandwidth, a peaceful environment, not having to work, having no caring duties, having no anxiety about any family members? And is it equally as good for the students for whom the situation is the reverse? So I would argue that this type of alignment largely applies always, but the tech aspect, the working from home aspect, really does add a new dimension and a new pressure on us as well as our students. So that brings me to this question. Should we deliver a synchronous or an asynchronous lecture? Um, my preference, my bias, actually, I feel that strongly about it, um, is that we should go asynchronous. So my lectures in what remained of last semester and also in my summer school were all asynchronous. This is partly because in both cases I was firefighting, so I was driven online like everybody else in extremists and I worked harder than ever I had since 
probably the first two or three years of um, lecturing in terms of preparation. And because I was aware I was delivering a compromised learning experience um, for students, I doubled and, and some occasionally even tripled my workload. Now that I'm not going to do again, right? But I do stand by the asynchronicity. Um, and in fact, this is something that I think I'm going to retain even when we go back to normal teaching, right? So I think that I will be employing blended learning much more from now on. Now, my lecture style has long been interactive. So usually when I'm lecturing, students are free to interrupt. They can ask questions as and when they please. Um, but in this circumstance, I am going to be delivering voiced over PowerPoints beforehand. And then I'm going to use the contact time that I've got with the students purely to talk with them to get into that deep versus surface learning. So we will be referring back to um, specific points in the lecture. And actually when I'm preparing the lecture, I will be pointing them to the fact that this is particularly nuanced or complex or significant, and therefore is something that we need to return to when we're all together. Um, and I'll also of course be going back to the reading. So in this way, even by delivering an asynchronous online lecture, I'm leaving space to replicate what I've always done in my lectures, i.e. to talk to the students about the specifics of that lecture. Um, going back to that 20 minutes um, attention span as well, there is, um, there, I have read uh, a few people talking about how 10 minutes is more the length of time that a student is going to stick with an online lecture. So um, I happened to actually be in California in March when things went to hell in a handbasket. And I was staying with a friend of mine who teaches nursing at a university there. And I was listening to him doing his voiceover PowerPoints and they were really, really long. And I was sitting there listening to them and thinking if I were a student, I would, I, I would have really switched off by now. So I suggested to him that he broke that up into smaller chunks so that students could manage their time more individually. And it would also help with bandwidth issues, so with um, the downloading of big files. Uh, and this seemed perfectly obvious to me um, and seemed like a better pedagogy than what he was doing. His students hated it. So the lesson from this is know your students and ask them. You can also try both ways, right? So try one week doing one single longer lecture and another week doing two or three smaller ones and then ask them which they prefer. And I think that there is some middle ground as well. So there's the compromise to of indicating during the presentation. So having that longer one, but saying, look, look, this would be a really good time to take a break, maybe to go back to the reading that you did for this and just pick up on this point and see whether you understand it a little bit more. And if not, make some notes and then we'll discuss it when we're back. So when I was doing my voiced over presentations, I was punctuating those presentations with prompts to break or alternatively to persevere, right? So saying things like, okay, only three slides to go, stay with it. So the point is again, that because we have lost that um, moment of social interaction, even if you're doing the lecture um, synchronously, you really do need to seize your opportunities to put the social interaction back in, right? So communicate with them, even in an asynchronous lecture, even if it seems to you like that this is a monologue. I think that they hear it very, very differently. Um, the other thing about this is that I ended up giving students far more of my time um, than uh, they would have got in normal times, right? So that was fine for the two classes I had, especially I was teaching a final year um, bachelor's EU Russia relations course. Um, and for that course, I always have good dedicated students who would talk forever about the relationship if I would give them the time. But actually that wasn't good practice on my part, right? So if you deliver a 20 minute lecture asynchronously, I think you're justified in taking that time off the online contact time that you then have. So just to be clear at Leiden, we have two hour spots for all of our classes. So if I am sending them a 20 minute lecture, I'm going to do 20 minutes less contact time with them uh, synchronously. 
And that's not just about protecting my time, it's about protecting theirs because they have got busy lives too and we know that students struggle with time management. So be careful not to overburden your students uh, as well as yourself. Um, and the, just another point about a good online lecture. So one of the things that I did wrong initially um, in April and into part of May was that I wasn't giving them the break that I would normally if we, would, if we were face to face because I would see normally face to face face that they were flagging and I'd say okay go have coffee or something but I was forgetting to do that when we were um, together online so um, I did get better about remembering this but I think it's really important to build it into your structure in terms of format um, now I got inspired on Twitter the other day by a conversation about video lectures and best platforms and I was all keyed up to go out and um, find out about it, set up my own YouTube channel and everything else, but I stopped myself, right? Because actually the feedback that I got from my students about the voiced over PowerPoints was good, right? They also got me face to face because I was still using that contact time to conduct a seminar synchronously. So my advice here of these um, alternatives that I've given you, so whether it's just the normal text with um, static images, whether it's the voiced over um, power, PowerPoints, uh, or whether you are doing videos, all of these are good, right? There really is no better or worse. There is just what you can do in the time that you have to do it. And as I say, because I see the advantages of voiced over lectures listened to asynchronously, and I will do this in future, I'm happy to invest the time learning and refining their production, right? So don't be made to feel that you have to upskill hugely in one semester. Do what you can when you can, but if you can see that this is going to have value in the long term, fine, go ahead and do it. Um, remember also that there are the same technical considerations here too, both for you and the students, so bandwidth, whether streamed or not. Not everybody has got um, uh, that, that kind of bandwidth in the house, if they've got, if they're living in a house with six other people, I know sometimes we're all fighting to upload stuff. Um, machine capability, all right, so my machine, I'm on my husband's machine now because my laptop was just not up to any of this. Um, and the other thing that I want to say is be careful if you're doing asynchronous lectures with any more of the more controversial controversial materials that you might cover, all right? So I teach international intervention, for instance, as part of an MA class, and sometimes we're dealing with very difficult images, difficult narratives, um, students are struggling with understanding, they're understanding with um, their, uh, they're struggling with their emotions. And if I'm not there to see it, that is actually quite a problem. So there are some things that I will not deliver in an asynchronous lecture that I would have done normally in the classroom where I could really manage whatever the reaction is. Um, so be sensible, if you're going to go asynchronous, um, give them materials that they can manage. And I do mean emotionally as much as anything else. Now, I've already alluded to this about um, alignment, but I really do want to emphasize the importance of alignment. It is not just that you want your students to attend, all right? So this is one of the problems about lectures, whether or not students attend. Once they're there, you want them to attend to what you're saying and to what their peers are saying. So your expertise is expected not only in relation to the subject or research area, um, it's about their program of study and it's about their future ambitions as well. So when I have been in the equivalent of pro program director roles, this has always been the place where I've encountered most resistance, right? And, and please don't get me wrong, I'm all for academic freedom. So one of the great things about being in the Netherlands is that I, I, I'm really kind of free from a, a lot of scrutiny. So I'm all for that. I think that academics should have control over their teaching materials. But at the same time, no academic is teaching in a vacuum. And it seems to me that this is a place where students can have reasonable expectations about your expertise. They can expect you to know something about that, um, their program of study. And they can ask, they could, uh, you know, reasonably ask questions about where a particular lecture fits in respect of that and certainly where your course fits. 
But I think that there's something deeper there too, because if you can show um, how your course helps them understand other things than they are studying, if you can show that it matters, that they, that they know how to put a questionnaire together, not just because it's on the course for research methods and they're going to get assessed on it, but because it helps them understand, for instance, how political parties manipulate their respondents, right? Isn't it worth making that connection for them? So stepping outside of your particular class and saying, but look at the bigger things that you're trying to achieve here in terms of understanding in your program. So make those connections. And in the process, you um, have the added bonus of showing that you're the expert in respect of their entire program of study. And this comes back to student engagement too, which I'll come to in a moment. Ah, good. I hope you can see that because it's looking a bit blank on mine. So can I just ask um, Donna or John, can you still see? Hi, Maxine, yes, I can see it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so your audience and um, you, and we are almost through this, as, as, as I say to my students as well, I'm not sure how many slides I've got, but not too many, we're almost through. All right. Um, so there's been plenty of discussion about diversity, equality and inclusion matters in, um, in respect of the pandemic generally um, and in respect of all levels of education, including higher education. So I'm going to assume knowledge on your part here and simply nudge you into remembering that a good online lecture will be created by somebody who is bearing all of this in mind. So I seem to spend my life on Twitter at the moment, um, but there was a fairly disturbing exchange on Twitter the other day about academics demanding that students have their cameras on, that they talk during an online class, etc. And I also remember quite a few people back in April and May moaning about students because they had their cameras off and how were they to know that they were there or not, etc, etc. Now, if I'm frank, and I, those of you who know me, I usually am, um, this actually suggests a good deal of ignorance to me. So I urge you, don't be that academic. I've had my camera off at most events because my laptop couldn't cope otherwise. And very often I've had sound issues, so I've only been able to participate um, through chat. So start off from a position of respecting and trusting your students. Don't force them to have their video on. You might just ask them to just try it so that if there is a moment, um, you, you know, and, and they want to, they can put it on. So I think that there is a difference between saying, can we just check that all of this is working and that those, when, when you do want to speak, that we can all hear you, all right? That's just technical stuff. But after that, let them, let them be silent, all right? But at the same time, provide other means for participation in this online world. So um, it can be the chat. Now, I personally have not been very, very good at, um, I, you know, I work very, very heavily off verbal cues. So for me, I have been, I would have preferred that my students had the video on and where they have, I have been kind of really watching their reactions. But that has made it quite difficult for me to monitor the chat as well. And so I have found it easier to direct them to the VLE, for instance, and say, okay, you know, maybe put up some questions and get them to answer things or to ask them to put their questions or even to email me. Um, and then I do try and find time when we are there synchronously and saying, okay, does anybody have any questions? And sometimes I specify them, sometimes I just leave it open. It, it depends on um, the classroom, right? But um, don't insist on a particular means of participation. I would provide multiple means. These are just difficult times. Um, the other things um, is don't assume technical competence. I think a lot of people do this and we shouldn't. Um, this also brings me to some of the personal characteristics that I think that you need to have in order to deliver a good lecture, particularly online, but even face to face. So they were summarized really well in an article by um, Helen Larkin, who in turn was drawing on the work of others. Um, and she, they were talking about your subject knowledge, right? So that must be in place. But um, you have to have some skill in making connections and in helping students to do the same. For those of you who've read Forster, this is your only connect. So, so important. 
so too is your ability to build relations with students on a personal level right so to really make that personal connection um, and then as Larkin puts it there is the research slash teaching nexus that you bring to the classroom now I've always thought that research led teaching is very very important but I also think that there is such a thing as teaching led research so I always approach a classroom with the idea that I can learn something from my students and again I think if you walk in with that attitude they really do pick up on it even in the online environment then there's your personality, have enthusiasm, be passionate. Um, I know that um, there is a lot of talk about not using humor too much because you are dealing um, with people with disabilities who find it difficult sometimes um, to do that. But I think that you, a, a little bit of humor, I don't mean sarcasm, you know, you know, no dripping sarcasm, but a little bit of humor as well helps you connect with the students. And then the final characteristic that Larkin talks about is your own capacity for self-reflection. Um, and certainly in one of the pieces that I was reading, somebody was talking about how one of the real benefits of an online lecture is that you can play your own lecture back. So perhaps for the first time for many of us, we really have got the evidence to reflect on our own teaching here. So I would certainly um, use that opportunity. All right, I'm running out of time, so just very quickly um, about, um, this is one of the final slides on the substance about student engagement. So there, as I've said already, there are some things that you cannot have online that you have face to face, all right? So you have se severely restricted opportunities for the kind of social learning that would normally take place. Um, Psychologists have been really, really useful in helping us understand the fatigue that we had by doing um, these, these kind of like Zoom classes or the equivalent, right? So the psychologists were saying very early on in this that it's, um, if we were feeling more, more fatigued than we would in a face-to-face -face class, that is because we're having to work an awful lot harder to pick up on all of those, um, uh, because we've lost those non-verbal cues. Um, so this means at least that you don't have the same opportunity to see when you've lost your classroom, right? I'm sure everybody has been in that in that place in the classroom where they're going like, okay, I've lost more than half of my students, right? And then you've got to kind of claw things back. It's more difficult online. So I would say in response to this, that knowing your students becomes even more important, right? I take photos of my students normally with their name in front of them, so I can very, very quickly learn their names, right? And I've never underestimated the significance of that for them, right? They know I care enough to know who they, am, who they are, but also since I also grade for active participation, they know that I, I know that I am who I am grading and whether I am grading fairly. Um, so one of the advantages of the online world is that most platforms have got the student's name. So at least here you are onto a winner. And I know I've heard lots of academics say they can never learn students' names. So I, I, I get that. That's fine. But here you have an advantage now. If you've got a big lecture class, all right, so if you're lecturing to 100 students or so, you can still talk to them about their program of study and so find ways of referring to their cohort identity. So you're still connecting to them less on an individual level but more as a cohort for those with smaller numbers as i say learn their names but learn their interests in terms of the subject area remember also what they asked about three weeks ago and refer back to it when it comes up again in a different context these really really small things send important messages to students about how much attention you are paying um, Final thing is be flexible, all right? If this is your first time doing online teaching or it's just not going as well as you had hoped, adapt, all right? And the way that you adapt is by polling your students regularly, more than you would do face to face, all right? So use the other tech that is available to you and to them. So it could be polling apps, it could just be the VLE, it could just be encouraging them to email you, whatever, keep it low tech, high tech. Um, whatever works for you, but make sure you know what they are thinking throughout all of this. Um, I think that we'll have to um, talk about this together, about the opportunities for value added, but certainly thinking about those um, diversity and inclusion issues, this is a good time to bring people into your program who you normally couldn't afford to do. 
And also don't exploit these people, right? If you can't afford to pay them, then at least offer to do a reciprocal lecture for them. Um, I have asked quite a few people if they could, um, you know, if they were interested in shared classrooms. So again, we can maybe um, talk about this together. So anyone teaching international intervention this coming semester, if you want to share a classroom with me, um, I'll be happy to have that conversation. Um, and um, share materials as well. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not meaning give the whole shebang, but if you know someone is under pressure, why not help them out and share the material? So someone did this for me last year when I was completely overloaded um, and it was a lifesaver. And hopefully he knows that any time at all, the favor will be returned. So I think just in this online world, um, share, show some solidarity. In summary then, all right, um, it's vital you give real consideration to the question of why you are lecturing in the first place. What does a lecture do that a seminar doesn't? Why this lecture? How does it align with other aspects of the course? How does it fit with the program of study? And crucially, have you actually articulated any of that to the students, all right? Don't keep it in your head, tell them as well. Not everything is new, right? You've got this, you can do it, all right? Um, make sure you're not just thinking about your students. An unhappy academic makes for very, very unhappy students. So um, yes, think about your students, but think about you as well. Design your lecture and your lecture series with you and them in mind. Um, and finally, I hope I've pointed to a few silver linings, all right? So this may have been forced on us, it may not be our preference, but there are advantages if we care to look for them. Um, now, I've included a couple of pages of references for those articles that I read to um, prepare for this. But for now, thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, and I'll hand over to Donna, I think, for, to handle any comments. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Maxine. That was great. And just to say that um, we will upload the the, the, um, the presentation um, and the recording, so people can can have access to those um, uh, references um, uh, after the event if they if they're interested. Um, lots of questions in the chat box. Um, I'll try and make my way through them. Um, but also, please, people, if people want to kind of you know post further questions, hopefully we can get around right to them as well. Um, so just kind of starting off, uh, Maxine, um, you talk about kind of favoring asynchronous which is something i also think is, i also favor um i think it kind of you know works well with kind of technical limitations etc um but you also note that it it kind of limits live interactivity i mean the, the clue is in the title um and you discussed using contact time instead to kind of you know dig down into kind of deeper meeting with students i just wondered what some of the other ways that can be done um you know there's forums um telephone calls social media like whatsapp email etc do you have any experience of kind of building on that kind of what's worked what hasn't worked etc yeah i think that there are i mean there are quite a, a, a lot of things the vle is the um obvious thing i assume all of us have got a vle in place but we also know that students don't always like that. Um, and if I'm totally honest, it's not something that I have completely cracked. It worked quite well in the summer school that I was doing, but you know, this was a short period of time. It was, you know, people who were literally giving up their summer to be there. So I think you know you have a different level of commitment. But there are so um, so many kind of polling apps um, that you can use. So I, I was ha having questions about Slido, for instance, um, uh, using polls. Uh, students can ask lots and lots of questions at that and then they can upvote. So for bigger classes, something like Slido, they can upvote um, those questions that they particularly want answered. And that's really useful, I think, for the academic for understanding where more students, when you've got the, that bigger class, um, where more students are having problems so that you can maybe go back. And, and this is what I mean about adaptability. So if you are using something like Slido, other apps are available, um, then, um, and then you decide, okay, I do need to go back to this, then you should be prepared to sacrifice a lecture. What I actually do is leave a couple of spare lecture, um, you know, class sizes in my syllabus, 
Um, and then I ask students what they want me to populate it with. So that's where I kind of build in that flexibility. Um, but I think that, yeah, there's quite a lot of good tech that can help you understand what students are really struggling with if the VLE doesn't work. Um, I also think as well that we don't quiz students enough on knowledge. So I started for a bachelor's class, the EU today, because I was tired of students telling me that um, Iceland was a member of the European Union. So um, I started just doing a multiple choice quiz. So I think that those are also quite good ways of reminding students that knowledge is um, really, really important. And it also, and, and in the feedback from those quizzes as well, I mean, this, uh, this was done, it was done in a face-to-face -face classroom, but it would work even better online, obviously. Um, in the feedback, the students said that the fact of that quiz, and it was just a small part of the assessment, but it still mattered to them, um, that that, that was what made them read the textbook because I said to them, all of the questions are going to come out of this textbook. Interesting, you mentioned the, the VLE. I think VLEs often get a bit of a bad rap. Um, they can be a bit clunky. Um, they can kind of look a bit old fashioned compared to kind of, you know, day to day kind of social media, which students are using. But I guess the, the advantage is it's it's pretty stable. We know what we're getting. There's a kind of a safety level to it. Uh, and, and Heidi uh, has made a point in the chat box that um, you know using too many different platforms and online tools, etc., can actually be overwhelming for students. So some some level of um, you know consistency, which a VLE does provide, can can be advantageous, I think, for students. Yeah, I, I agree. I just know, so we were just with Blackboard and our students just never used it. Um, but we have just changed VLE, so I'm definitely going to be using it a lot more. Probably creating some threads of my own with some, some questions or, you know, maybe a choice of questions and asking the students to write a little bit. And then, of course, assessments is, you know, the obvious way to get them to use this is to have an assessment that requires them, for instance, um, to contribute to a thread, you know, any, or any three threads, something like that. So um, it's just really important, I think, in thinking about what it is that, that you want to achieve. So what's, what is the purpose of using it? Is it to replicate um, those kind of interpersonal relations to build the peer to peer? What, you know, what is, it, what is it that you're trying to do, essentially? So think that through um, first. But I think, you know, if, if you get enough students telling you that they hate the VLE, I think you do have to pay attention to that. I hate the VLE, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so some VLEs are yeah, more more trouble than they're worth, aren't they? But I think I think yeah. the point that Heidi made about kind of um, you know, having a, you know, a limited number of apps and, and tools, etc., is, is generally a good one. Um, and someone else has um, uh, made the point. Ronnie asked a question earlier on about um, an interesting idea about including interactive. Um, activities within the recorded lecture, such as a quiz um, that students need to take before they can then proceed on to the kind of the next bit of the lecture or maybe the next lecture itself. That sounds quite an interesting way of, 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 uh, of, of going about things. Um, yeah, I was, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember who gave the information literacy talk, but that was one of the points that they made though, was being careful about switching between, uh, having students switch uh, between different media. So doing it at the end, so finish the lecture, I'm done with that, and then go on and do something else. Yes, um, he was saying was absolutely fine. But having it kind of in the middle, asking them to go away, use a different tool, and then come back to the lecture, he was saying that actually that doesn't work very well. So, and, and I guess it comes back to Heidi's point really as, as, as well. You don't, if we have trouble with the stuff, students have trouble with this stuff as well. Um, but, but find something that works for you and that you think can make work for the, the students and, and use it, but be careful. I, I, I do take the point about um, not switching between lots and lots of different things. Um, you talk um, about kind of, you know, potential kind of uh, limitations, etc. But I also wonder about, are there things that we can do online in lectures that we can't do in, 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 in face-to-face -face settings and what are the opportunities perhaps as well as the disadvantages? Um, I, I don't see, so I suppose this is where I trouble with, um, I, I have trouble with synchronous um, lectures, that it seems to me that that is just an attempt to replicate as precisely as we can what we always do. Um, so I do think that there are advantages in the asynchronous um, uh, material because you, you can stop them, for instance. You can say, okay, look, you know that you're supposed to have done this reading. 
I'm talking about this and I'm trying to help you through this, but if you're having trouble understanding what I'm saying here now, this is probably a good point to stop this and go back to this. And you can even point them to specific parts of, um, uh, of, the, of the reading concerns. Alternatively, if you're talking about things, um, you know, if you're talking about empirics, um, then, you know, I do think that, yes, you can then say, all right, so you've got, and, and you can maybe preface this right at the start. So you can say to the students, all right, you've got this 20 minute lecture that you want to listen to. However, you are going to need 40 minutes, really, because I'm going to ask you as preparation also to go and do this other thing. So make sure that they know this in advance and they can build in that time. And then they could, for, for instance, go looking for evidence of something that's going on in the world that fits very well with this kind of abstract idea and then come back to the classroom kind of really very, very well prepared with having done the reading, having read your lecture, but also showing that they've thought about how what you said in the lecture applies to the evidence that they can see in the real world. So I do think that those are advantages. And of course, you can do that um, in the classroom and, and I do do it, but th this way they do it when they want to, when they're in the mood, and maybe you get a better response that way. No, I think that's true. And I think there are you know, advantages as well, more generally. Um, I think that I found, you know, at the OU, um, you know, obviously we do a lot of online teaching alongside some face-to-face -face teaching. Um, but, you know, we have students with particular kinds of disabilities, etc., um, kind of caring responsibilities, kind of uploaded asynchronous stuff is absolutely essential for kind of widening participation yeah. in that respect as well. So there, there is this kind of uh, more general argument, the more we can do that kind of thing, the more we kind of widen opportunity, I think, for people as well. No, absolutely. And I, you know, I had that, I had a student who just could not stay in the classroom and she just sent me lots of emails saying, thank you so much for the asynchronous lectures, because even though I was recording the synchronous lectures, I, I mean, the synchronous sessions with the best will in the world that then they're, they're not the most riveting thing to go and, and play and watch. But, you know, for her, she was just saying like, okay, I, I could do half an hour or whatever it was for your online lecture when her, um, when her toddler was asleep, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I suppose I don't, I also don't particularly want to overplay these things as well, because I know that a lot of academics are worried that we will focus so much on the advantages that we'll, we'll, we'll kind of start to do ourselves out of a job in terms of face-to-face <laughs> -face teaching. So um, I, I, I think that if a student has signed up for a course where, that is primarily built on the notion of face-to-face -face teaching, then, then that is what they want. And so it is quite difficult in those circumstances, I think, to give them precisely the type to replicate the experience that they that they want purely online. Um, whereas there are there are perfectly good places like the OU to go for for these for these other people too. But um, yeah, some of my students have have uh, been. I always remember um, oh my, um, Andrew Russell when he gave a, a presentation about. Uh, uh, doing uh, mini clips of lectures and then they were also uh, looking at when students were watching them and you know they would be watching them at two o'clock in the morning in bed or something he would get all this feedback oh Andrew I was listening to you while I was in bed and and <laughs> he didn't quite know what to deal with it to deal with it but to do with it but the fact is that yes it does give students kinds of um, options to access this material when is good for them, which is exactly why with lectures, I think that I will do this as part of blended learning in the future. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of the key point you said at the end there, that it, it's something that will actually, I would hope, um, potentially um, lead institutions which, which do work in a face-to-face -face session, considering these issues a bit more, um, the blend, um, different kinds of students, kind of how to kind of meet people's different needs, etc. It might, in a, in, a, in a strange way, actually kind of have a positive effect um, and help people consider these issues more generally. Yeah. Um, a question from, from John. Um, if working on a series of asynchronous lectures, is it better to put one up each week or all at once? Um, and other people have kind of chipped in and asked, you know, what, you know what's, what's good timing there? Um, definitely um, don't put them all up at the time, right? Because this is, um, so for the summer school, even though it was just a week, I had, so I prepared all of the PowerPoints. Um, I had all of the text there, all of the images, but I hadn't done the voiceover. Um, and I did the voiceover at the, um, at the end of each day. 
um, purely because I could then put in comments about, so remember when we were talking about this and Richard was asking the, that question, well, this is where we really see it. So these were the, this is the way that I could use the voiceover to show that I had been paying attention to what the students were saying, but also to help them make those types of um, connections so that they knew that what I was saying on Friday was um, connected to what I'd been saying on Tuesday. Um, so I, I, did see some, I did see some talk about people um, saying that the advantage is that if you do everything well in advance, you can put it up and then students can really go through the whole course in their own time. I don't think that is the right thing to do if you want to also have those interpersonal relations um, and to make those connections to the students. So I would advocate um, having it already just doing that voiceover as soon as you can after your last class and then putting it up so that they've got a week um, to actually listen to it. But as I say, you can have you can have as many of the, the actual PowerPoints done. It's just the voiceover that you're then doing at the last minute. Yeah, because it's, it's a, a balancing act, isn't it? You don't want people to kind of skip ahead too far and then kind of confuse themselves confuse others, um, you know, focus on the wrong bits of assessment, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and make their own lives difficult, etc. And also kind of make, make, you know, your life difficult, asking you questions about stuff, which is, you know, two months in the future, etc. So it's about kind of, I think, kind of self-care as an academic, as well as kind of caring for the students as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, if you, if you have really thought through your course and you've really thought about how it builds, um, then you, you know, it, it, it would make a bit of a mockery of the two uh, of the two hours or the hour or whatever it is that you do have with them synchronously all right so for that kind of more seminar session if you were saying okay for some of you skip six weeks ahead i you know it, it would suggest that actually what you do in in week two doesn't really matter that you can still process everything that happens in week six I, and I, I don't think that's a great message to send out um, a question from Scott. Uh, well, he, he mentioned um, giving students the option to send in questions um, by, by email or video or audio, etc. that can then be incorporated into the next lecture recording. And that could be actually splicing them in if you have the technical ability, or it could be um, just referring to them. Um, and kind of a, a general question really is how much student input do we have into our into our kind of online lectures no input some input um is, is there a difference in doing things online to how we do things face to face um great question uh and i suppose well my instinct is always to um uh to include the student as much as i can but at the same time i'm also aware of the fact that i have a course I think that there is, so this, this, this goes, I think, to really thinking about the purpose of a lecture, right? That there is a certain amount of knowledge that you do want to convey to the students as being important to understand, right? That these are the key underpinning concepts. These are the types of scenarios that you need to think about. Um, this is the type of appropriate evidence. These are the different theory, you know, all of, all of this kind of thing. And the student isn't the expert in this. Um, at the same, so I, I would say maybe a little bit um, of input from the student in terms of the lecture material, but not to the point that you undermine yourself as the expert as well. All right now, I've never really had a problem with authority in the classroom beyond my, you know, my first couple of years. I've, I've been pretty confident, but I also know that there are quite a lot of academics who struggle sometimes to establish authority in a classroom. And I don't think then that it is a great idea to cede um, that, that much expertise to the student. But you do want to know um, what they are interested in. You do want to know what they would like to delve into a little bit more deeply. But I would say that that is more for the seminar um, session rather than the lecture. But again, when I'm doing those asynchronous lectures, I am still thinking about what we were talking about in the seminar. So I would maybe refer back to it and say, you know, so this was when, so Scott asked this question, all right, so let's just deal with it. This is where it really kind of, um, we can discuss it in more detail. So let's just kind of think about that in a bit more depth. I think you can do that without suggesting that they are the ones who've told you, alerted you to the fact that this needs to be discussed as well. So. Uh, 
that there's a balance um, to be achieved there. Um, the more confident people, yes, you, you may want, you may be happy uh, to let students uh, do a little bit more, but um, for those of you less so, you might want to keep a bit more control. Yeah, I think that leads me to, to the next question, really. You, you talked about kind of the, the seminars and the, and the balance between lectures and seminars. Um, obviously, in a face-to-face -face context, in the online context, there might be an online seminar that, or there might be some other kind of form of interactivity, which kind of replaces that. I just wonder if you can kind of perhaps expand a bit more on your thinking about the, the balance between the two and kind of getting that right. Um, well, I mean, so, the, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on the Leiden model, all right, so we teach whether it's for um, bachelors or masters, we're doing two hour sessions uh, with them. Sometimes we are, um, we have, they've had a six week lecture series um, and then they have got six weeks of seminars and so in those circumstances, so if I'm doing one of those courses, then I'm not preparing a lecture at all because that is to defeat the purpose. Um, and I'm just spending the two hours in a kind of seminar situation, but we're small groups, no more than 20 students at a time. So that's manageable online as well as um, face to face, obviously. Um, but for my electives, uh, which are two hours again, and they're premised on an idea of one hour lecture followed immediately by one hour um, seminar with the same group of students. I've never done that you know I've always um, just made it very very interactive so and so the lecture might go over the, the whole kind of two hour period now that is something that I am changing hugely here because I am stripping out the lecture entirely delivering that to them asynchronously and then I'm spending the little bit less than two hours now with them just talking about the things that we would have been doing um, ordinarily um, but I am also um, thinking um, this time that sometimes I'll do the first hour where it was just questions about the lectures and then I do want to spend, so I do think that this is quite a good opportunity to spend some time with students with um, art journal articles particularly, because I often do this in a class and I say have a copy of the journal article and let's go through it and everything else, but actually having the screen there and everybody focused on the screen, I think it is a, is a bit easier. So I have actually built into my syllabus um, an hour to just kind of go through um, key points from an article where I might be drawing their attention to a section, but just asking them to really articulate what they're getting out of it. So I am doing slightly different things with um, one of those hours. That leads to a, a, a good question from John, actually. You mentioned you attended the um, uh, information literacy uh, seminar we did um, a few days ago. Um, the question he asked is about the potential problems relating to the availability of books or indeed journal articles. Uh, to what extent might lectures need to cover material that can't now be accessed in a kind of traditional written form? Yeah, it was int it was really interesting at that because um, at Leiden the library didn't close, so if, as long as so international students, many of them had had to go home, so that was a problem for them in books, but for books, um, but for um, uh, in, in Leiden you have to order your books anyway, and they put them in lockers and they kept it open for so students could always get the books, so that wasn't a problem that I had had um, actually. Um, but we do have the usual um, problem in that we, we sometimes don't have sufficient copies of a book. Uh, we try, we, we've got quite a lot of ebooks, but occasionally, um, uh, yeah, it, it, we do have a situation where students are scrambling um, for books. I increasingly, because I, I, I think, I used to have so many students who didn't have very much money. Um, and so I long ago tried not to um, assign books that they had to buy or where I knew that the library couldn't afford to get e-books or enough copies of them. So I tend to rely much, much more heavily on journal articles or on textbooks where I know that there are e-books. So um, I'm probably not best positioned to, to answer that because I, I, I just haven't had that problem. But that is also partly because I, I learned to compensate quite a long time ago. I don't like forcing students to spend money on books. 
I think it's something that you know many people will have to consider in more detail there I mean I think we both work for institutions where a lot of that work's already been done because of the way that we you know either individually we design our modules or, or, or in my instance the kind of the university I work for we have to make sure that everything's available online because students are, are working at home anyway um, but I think it's something that people will have to kind of think about um, in yeah. more detail and potentially kind of have to be a bit more innovative in terms of resources and also the, the perhaps the assessment that they, they put on as well um, we only have a few more minutes left but I just kind of wanted to kind of mention that lots of people are saying that um, their institutions are saying 10 to 15 minutes only um, for their for their kind of lectures um, and they have to be um, uh, asynchronous rather than synchronous um, and also the kind of their universities are kind of mandating uh, kind of particular things etc so it's interesting to kind of see some of the kind of the, the themes which are coming through one of which is definitely this idea of kind of chunking the material into kind of more more kind of digestible chunks um, and at the same time part of me thinks actually are we kind of missing out on innovation potentially because as you mentioned earlier there might be some you know some student groups or some kind of modules where kind of longer stuff works really well so it'll be in interesting to see if we have the kind of the kind of uh, the kind of reverse impact a kind of a negative impact um in that respect as well yeah i think it's um I, I'm, I'm very glad i work for an institution that is not mandating how i do my lectures i, I you know anyway that's <laughs> that's a that's a whole different conversation but i don't know if i assume that the heidi who asked the question earlier is heidi maurer um you know heidi and i talk a lot about attention spans um, and um, I, I worry some, because I think about when I was an undergraduate, I could listen to a, a lecture for an hour and I could take notes and, um, and you know, I, then I used to type them up and everything else. But, but the point is I did have an hour attention span. And so I wonder whether we are not contributing to the problem of small attention spans. So is it really true? I, you know, I, I don't know, without having, um, without having seen the evidence for it, from my own field, I've seen you know a few articles uh, written by people in other fields, and and even then they they don't seem very conclusive on it about what is a good amount of time for an online lecture. Um, so I personally would hope that we would do a little bit of sucking it and seeing. Um, my lectures I think have been between twenty and thirty minutes. I did do for the summer school. I was very, very, very responsive. So something that wasn't in the syllabus, but it kept kind of kept on cre um, cropping up. So I was just like, okay, it's, it's not that I don't know this stuff. So I'll just whip together a quick lecture. And that was like a seven minute lecture um, for them, just voiced over just on, on those issues that they had. So I was, I, you know, I was, I was very much thinking on my feet and listening to what they were saying. Um, so I, I, th I would say it depends. And I don't see what the problem is with a well-crafted, um, enthusiastic 30-minute um, online lecture where the lecturer is doing their best to connect with the students and I, I would try it but I wouldn't make all of them like that uh, that's the thing this is I mean spice it up have a little bit of variety do some 10 minutes do some 20 do some 30 depends I think there'll definitely be some good kind of research and scholarship over the next kind of year or so on on these topics. Obviously, there's lots already, but I think we, on a kind of now all this is happening on a on a kind of wider scale. It'll be really interesting to kind of see um, what the results are. I think we're going to have to wrap up there because we're getting very close to four o'clock. I just want to say thank you um, everyone for coming and thanks to you, for you, to you Maxine for such a great session especially on such a hot day where I am anyway I'm absolutely boiling. Um, if we didn't get round to answering your question I know there are a couple of outstanding ones please do put them on on the on, on Twitter um, using the hashtag and we can answer them online. Um, the recorded session will appear on the website shortly and we'll also send you a feedback email. Um, if you want a certificate of participation um, if you've attended free sessions um, please email psateach at psa.ac.uk and we'll organise one for you. The next session is on Tuesday the 18th of August at 3pm hosted by Helen Williams from the University of Nottingham on teaching statistics online. So we hope to see you there and thanks for coming.